welcome to the Startup Grind. We do a lot of clapping at Startup Grind. Startup Grind um, is, a, is a worldwide Google-backed entrepreneur platform that illuminates some of the world's best talent in the startup community. It's designed to connect people, build community, network, and actually really, really expose the life and the, the actual things that startups go through. And so tonight, this marks, how many have we done so far, Jason? You know? Six, six. About six. We've done about six startup grinds. We're actually building up some momentum. Startup grind, when we first got into the game, there was actually like 40, 45 chapters all over the world. Right now, there's over 100 chapters all over the world, and Tallahassee's on the maps. So go ahead and clap, clap it up for that. There's a few shout outs that I definitely want to do before we even get started. I want to send a shout out to Easy Meals. Easy Meals rock the house tonight. How many people like the food? Raise your hand. Some of you still eating. Clap it up for that. I was eating the meatballs and everything. Everything was good. It was really, really good. Um, Mike Copeland back there with Mike Copeland and his production as far as the video. He's doing a good job. Clap it up for him. One, one thing that's really, really cool about Tallahassee, we have some really unique talent. And I just want to kind of illuminate Mike and what he's done. When we first brought him on, he was like, Vince, I'm a storyteller. You, I got video cameras. I do my thing, but I'm really a storyteller. And he proved himself. And he actually published one of the very first black and white versions of a startup grind video. And everybody in California went ham. They were like, we've never seen anything like this. And so we have a very unique flavor with our videos on the Startup Grind website. If you haven't been to it, go to startupgrind.com. Click on the East, find Tallahassee. You'll see some of the videos that we've done. Mike Clopin is a genius behind the camera, and if you need any type of video production, make sure you check him out. Woo! That's right, go ahead, give it up. <laughs> Definitely gotta show a bunch of love to Dummy Ventures. Dummy Ventures is making some moves, everybody. How many people in this room love Dummy Ventures? <laughs> yes, indeed. Dummy Ventures came in with a vision, and they wanted to knit the startup community together at a very intimate level. And Domi, which I understand means home. This is where everything starts and where it happens. And ever since they've been here, they've been really, really being, they've really been a catalyst in my mind to really, really knitting the community together. Everything from content on the web to providing space for the startups to actually get their thing going. Um, insight, resources, mentorship. I mean, there's, I mean, they've done so much. I mean, it's like mind blowing to me because these are things that we imagined happen in Tallahassee, but they've actually made it happen. So again, I want to give them another round of applause and just give them a whole bunch of love. A whole bunch of love. And this right here is just for the camera. For everybody out there around the world, know that Tallahassee and Domi Ventures and Massive Corporation and everybody that's involved in the startup community, we're coming out there to actually get involved and become part of the world's largest story that's being told right now, which is in the startup community and startup grind. Tonight is a really, really special night for me because this team that we've got up here, the Les team, is a team that I've known for some time, and each one of these people I've had intimate connections with. Their story is a really, really awesome story, and their story is a story that has a lot of deep meaning, and we're going to really, really dig into them tonight. And I'm going to step aside, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves and, and talk about their company, but Les is a, is a profound company here in the area working in the space of energy. And, and the information that sits behind energy. And I'm excited about tonight's interview because there's gonna be a lot on the table that we're gonna talk about and there's gonna be a lot that you guys learn. Listen to everything that's being talked about because there is gonna be a Q&A session at the end where you have an opportunity to ask them questions. I want you to dig into them and really, really get out that content uh, because it's deeply important. So without further ado, this is Les. Go ahead and clap it up for Les. So the very first Thing that I want to do is one talk about less at a very high level let's talk about less what is less what is the mission of less and then we're going to dig in and get a little bit more granular and actually talk to each one of you and you know get your story like how did you get into less so on and so forth is that cool with everybody cool so the story of less what is what is the mission of less and where did less come from and why is it less and not more I'm just well, curious less is a <laughs> less is a people-centric energy intelligence company, and we have a mission to uh, make energy affordable and transparent. And we believe that your energy information is yours and you deserve to have it. So uh, we set out to basically deliver your information that's sitting in the smart grid to you and make it useful to you. 
Wow, awesome, awesome, that's good stuff. And so how did, how did the Les team meet all together? How did you guys form this little, this little crew up? Where'd you guys meet at? So uh, the Les story has a lot of different branches, mm-hmm. but uh, it originally starts with a professor and a student, a pair of students of his, and they, they had the idea, the concept, of working with the utility company to find an easy way to distribute usage data. Mm-hmm. And they, the professor had, had some, some deep tech background and uh, they did not have a front end person. And I was recruited in to fill that role. Uh, so it started at FSU and the College of Business. Okay, cool. And who are you, by the way, anyway? You know what? I should probably tell you. You should tell us, yeah, tell us who you are and tell us. Absolutely. My name is Gregor Richardson, and I do the company's graphic work. So I do the interface and aesthetics for our websites and all our other platforms. Which is awesome. But uh, that's what it says on my business card, at least. <laughs> my, uh, my real job is a lot easier than that. I make things look pretty, and I make things make sense. Wow. That's awesome. That's awesome. And I'm Guy Yazbek. I'm the company's backend developer. I joined Less through a partnership that I had with Gregor Richardson. Uh, we were in another startup while he was working with Less, and they needed a, another developer to accelerate their, their progress. And I, I volunteered. So you like raise your hand for this. Yeah, I'm like, he volunteered for all this. If, if, if you guys, if, if what you're going to find by the end of this, you're going to learn a lot about less. These guys have actually had the full rigor of a startup. I mean, it's been interesting. It's been about two years that you guys have been in the mix. And I'm Jason Stam, CEO of less. Um, I got involved in the project about two years ago. I was actually on the Citizens Advisory Committee for the utilities for about two years prior to that, trying to convince the utilities staff to do more with the grid information that they had. Um, Then Gregor and I knew each other through the Taltech Alliance. Uh, He was an intern and uh, I'm still a pretty active volunteer. Uh, He showed me the prototype that they had and so I dove right in with uh, what they needed, which was investment and leadership. So um, that's how I got involved. And again, you guys have been in this thing for like over two years. Am I, am I legit in saying that? It's like been two years that you guys have actually been in the grind. You've gone through several different types of teams, iterations of teams. I've seen you guys kind of grow up, grow down, and split, come back together. A lot of different morph, a lot of morphing, right? Can you talk a little bit about that morphing? like? Your team dynamic is really interesting to me. How did you guys, because again, you like on what? How many iterations is this of the team? This is the sixth version of the less, <laughs> we call it the less mob. This is the sixth version of the less mob. Wow, wow. And what, got, what caused you guys to transition and shift and, and change your team, team around so many times? Well, what would you say is the, the thing well, that? Well, really, we all, have, we, we stuck with it. And that's, that's where it was. It's, it's um, and, When we first started, uh, our goal, like I said, was to um, uh, make really good use of the utility uh, grid information, make it, uh, make that energy intelligence available to everybody. Um, The, of course, the utility was using it to more efficiently manage their grid, and that same energy intelligence needed to be, that benefit needed to be provided to the end consumer. Uh, So there are other companies that do this. They, they, this is not a new idea, and it, it hasn't been since its inception, but um, they charge hundreds of thousands of dollars to utility companies. Uh, and so we, our next goal was to uh, figure out how to do that for less, much, much less. <laughs> so and, this is why you're not more. Yep. And, and it <laughs> has taken uh, almost two years to figure out how to do that, but we did it. And now we can actually offer it to communities like Tallahassee that's for right. much, much less. That's right. Clock that up right there. That's, that's called disruption. Disruption, given the information um, in a disruptive kind of way. I'm feeling a little remorse because, like, each one of you, this is really meaningful work to me because we've had, like, deeper conversations about, because you said the word people-centric. 
That's a cool word. Who agrees that's a cool word? I think that's a cool word. People-centric, people-centric company. Um, and I really want to dig into the soul of Les, again, because I've had a, the opportunity to kind of be around you guys for a period of time, and each of you have a really unique story. I think that story shared will actually add value to not only the people in this room, but just the general startup grind community as a whole. Do you mind sharing a little bit about your personal story of like how you're connected, you know, at the hip to this thing that you're so passionate about for two years still in the grind? Do you mind doing that? Well, Gregor's the soul of the company, so. Well, we absolutely will get to that, but before, I wanted to take a moment, especially for all the new people, and explain what it is. Uh, Less is our platform allows you to use our website or our mobile app and see your electricity usage. You can do it for free. Lessutility.com is our site, and our app is for Android and iOS. And you can use our app to find out how much you spent the day before. Uh, we have our partnership with the city of Tallahassee, and any residents can look up their address and receive that info. And we push it out to you. It can be through the app, through the website, through an e email, daily or weekly. And that way you have the ability to monitor your spending and you can take action on it right away. Instead of having to wait till the end of the month to look at your bill, you can find out, wait a minute, I spent $5 yesterday. I know my normal is only about two. And that way we uh, empower you to, to, to do more with less. That's awesome. Right at this point, Mike, I need you to play like some really cute like little music because I'm about to do a commercial like testimony style, if y'all don't mind. I actually, <laughs> I actually used the platform and I remember when they first started talking about the platform and at first I was like, okay, that's some kind of cool information. But then once I actually got the actual application and I started using it, you would, like it really really transformed the way that I looked at energy usage like if one week I spent like $27 but the week before I had only spent like 18 I was freaking out I was like what what was I doing and so I actually started getting conscious about turn off the lights you know it was it was it was crazy but that's really really important because if we become conscious about a thing then we can take action so that one simple move is so magical to me. So I appreciate everything that you guys have done to actually bring it forward and actually make it available. And what is it? What is the website? Yet Less Utility? Lessutility.com. I haven't even been to the website in a while because once you get it, it's set and you just get notifications. It's like sweet. It's awesome. It's frictionless. So if you haven't done it, do it. Less Utility. Know how much you're spending because it's important. It's cool stuff. So I'm still going to ask you, what's your personal business? I'm about to dig into it. So... <laughs> He was like, I'm off the hook. I told what Les was about. <laughs> no, we want to dig a little bit more. Like, so what is your reason for staying? What is your staying power? What is your, your big why? Why do you do it? I'll let one of them tackle first. Okay, good. Quick. My reason for staying with the team is trust. I've known Gregor for our other businesses, and we've proven to be very persistent in our goals, regardless of the hardship or any financial issues that we may encounter along the way. And I know that Jason and all his businesses, he has a lot of passion for what he does. And he's been following through strong with, with all that he does. And that trust was very important to me, especially since I've been with, with the company for two years. But above all, we, we're in the business of making a difference. We're actually helping the citizens of Tallahassee to be more, more conscious of their spending by getting the information that we already have. That's really cool. And, the, and you have an interesting dynamic, Guy, the fact that, you, what is your role on the team? You say it, I don't want to say it, you say it. Uh, I am the back-end developer. Back developer. So I develop the back-end for Gregor, and I develop the, the iOS API, mm -hmm. and the, the iOS app, and, and any, anything of the part that you guys don't see. Right, he's the pro, <laughs> he's the one who writes the code. The, the reason, <laughs> The reason why I say that he's, he's interesting is because, you know, when I talked to Guy, he talked about, you know, the fact as a coder, as a developer, we all know that he could actually go out and get great jobs and, and do really, really cool stuff, make tons of money, right, with his skill, with his craft. But what he decided to do is actually take his craft and apply it to something that was meaningful to him. I definitely had the opportunity, like many of computer science and business students graduating from FSU, but I, I refused to do something that, to me, wouldn't bring value to my life. I wanted to do something that would help others. Yes, yes, I clap that up. 
You see me? I'm like, I ain't even got no jokes. I ain't even got no jokes for that. Like, how do you bust jokes around that? That's cool. Like, I'm going to do something meaningful. So <laughs> that is really awesome stuff. Jason, what, what connects you at the end? Because I know you'd be a passionate brother, man. So uh, thank you for that. Um. <laughs> he said thank you. He said, he said thank you for that. Like, <laughs> well, uh, two years is actually a is, it's an interesting uh, cycle for a startup. We have we 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 have just this past summer launched all of our all facets of our um, first applications, and uh, uh, we I stuck with it because you know it. It matters, and that's really what it boils down to. It, this matters. It's already happening in other places, uh, and it's not happening in Tallahassee for various uh, financial and economic reasons in the decision-making process. So we had to figure out how to fit the value proposition into what would work here so that everybody could have access to it. Um, and I mean everybody, not just people with smartphones. Uh, Gregor, oddly enough, you forgot to say SMS. So uh, you, can get a, you can get a text notification as well. You can even get a tweet. So if you, don't have a mo if you don't have a smartphone, if you have a feature phone, you can still use the information on the platform. And that's what is really important to me, that it's inclusive, that we found a way to make it affordable and inclusive for everybody. Um, the, the other thing is that, uh, well, we really see the energy industry moving fast. There's, a, there's billions of dollars just being dumped into into it every week. Uh, new products and services are coming out all the time. And nobody was really doing it the way that we're doing it. So over that two years, we thought, well, we're, if we've got something that unique in a way that we're offering this, then we should keep going. If, somebody, if we had seen somebody um, doing it the way that we're doing it, we probably would have rolled back, pivoted big time, or just stopped. And um, it's, we, we haven't done that. We were able to stick with it. We were able to see it all the way through to launch. And you can all have it. You can all use it. It's already there. Um, we have eff effectively launched. Uh, we just haven't really scaled. Wow, that's really cool. And there was a story that you shared with me some time ago that really, really pulled on you know, my, my drive to really kind of see you guys come to fruition. I'm like, I really want to see this thing happen. And you tell the story about like information, mm -hmm. right? How important and valuable, because you'll hear him say that over and over again. You'll find that um, throughout the course of the Jason just keeps referring back to the information, how you should have your information. And when he shared with me his passion about just people having data and why, it really, really helped me have a, a deeper insight to what made him tick. One of the, uh, I am a big proponent of being informed, you know, uh, and it, that's not, that's not a, it shouldn't always be a pull. You shouldn't have to always pull the information, especially if it already is yours and it belongs to you. The, it should be a push, and that's what we do. We push it to you. You, don't have, you can just set it up. You ask once, and we will continue to push it to you until you say stop, um, which hopefully you don't. But the, the thing is, is that being informed in these areas, energy spending, utility spending, like it or not, is, a, is kind of a critical spending uh, item in the household budget for a lot of people. And this is one area that people can make a difference. You see a lot of people making a difference in their home, in their uh, domestic budget, in, um, the, sorry, uh, disposable income in um, uh, food. And they're scaling back and making sort of alternative choices that aren't necessarily to their own benefit in food. Well, I would really like to find other ways that are to their benefit where they could scale back, like using less in energy, spending less on their electricity, water, and natural gas, uh, not, not putting unhealthy food in their bodies and, making, and scaling back on their education or their inf other information sor so, uh, services, or certainly their health. Uh, so this is one area that actually giving somebody their information and enabling them to do less was, and spend less was a good thing for them, not a bad thing. Wow, that's very, very powerful. Do you guys want to add anything to that or piggyback on that a little bit? Yeah. Well, so utility usage is something that affects almost everybody. And depending on your circumstance, you might spend five minutes a month thinking about it, or it might be on your mind every day. And if we have an opportunity to improve people's interaction with that utility consumption, even just for those five minutes, and that's a goal that's worth pursuing. 
He is worth pursuing. Absolutely. That is so huge to me. And the product in itself, um, the less applications, because there was, a, there was a genesis of that, there was an evolution of, of the product in itself, it's gone through some iterations. And we talked a little bit about, because when we talk to the startup community, there's buzzwords that pop out. How many people are familiar with what an MVP is? Raise your hand if you know what an MVP is. Can somebody tell me what an MVP is? Go ahead. Minimal, minimum viable product, right? Get it to the marketplace fast. I actually did a um, blog post, it had to be probably about three or four months ago, and I talked about the race to mediocre. Because you have a lot of people just shipping, 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 shipping. And then you have companies like 53 um, who actually did the, the platform paper, which is a brilliant application. It's doing really, really well in the marketplace. Well, when I had a chance to talk to Les and, and talk about this concept of the MVP, they kind of flipped it upside down on its head for me. And it was powerful. And so I want to talk a little bit about less in the MVP process and why it looks fundamentally different than any other MVP. I'll start this one off, but I'm not going <laughs> to. This is a rabbit hole for me. But the, um, uh, there's a reason why we are the sixth version of the team. We are actually shipping the product the way it should be shipped. Uh, other people who got involved in the product wanted to either move faster or do things a little bit differently or their circumstances changed, and they couldn't really hang with it for legitimate reasons. Uh, and they're, everybody's still in the family. They all have shirts like this, too. They're just not on the management team. I got team. one. They wouldn't let me wear mine. <laughs> uh, they all have shirts like this, too. They're just not on the management team. But we are the ones who took two years to get our minimum viable product ready to launch the way that it has to be launched in order to be relevant in the marketplace. Well, I'll make my answer really simple. So representing the front end side, the user interface, user experience side, the minimum viable product for me is something that my dad can use without calling me for tech support. <laughs> that, that's, that's, there we go, clap that up. <laughs> Dad'd be like, what is this? Push the button, Dad, what button? I'm just kidding. Um, but there was, a, there, was, there, was a, <laughs> there was a part of our conversation about MVPs and you illuminated, it was Guy who illuminated the word, he said, Vince, viable. That's the part that's so critical, viable, right? right. And we dug into viable. Well, so in, this, in this case, the, the viability really is balanced between the end consumer and the utility. So our customer is both. Um, the utility, they are running a business. Here we're lucky we have the number one public utility in America. Clap that up. Heck yeah. <laughs> City of Tallahassee <laughs> Utilities, number one public <laughs> utility in America. Uh, uh, things in general go really well here. Uh, they, they are doing things mostly right. And I don't know what they're doing wrong, but they're doing them mostly right. So the, um, uh, they're one customer. And they kind of need to protect their reputation with the end consumer. Uh, it's not that they want to filter the information, but if that information is going to get delivered, and it upsets the end user, they're not going to call less. They're going to call the utility customer service line. And so the information, we are going to be the messenger for some sensitive news here. So our product, the minimum viability on how it's, how it's going to be successful in balancing that relationship that the rate payer, we call them, that's the anonymous term for the end consumer is the rate payer and the, and the utility company, that's something that we really had to get right on both sides. And that wasn't something we could ship quickly. And so that, that's um, really where, where the viability, it took a long time to get to, to, get to viable on that one. That's cool. So if, if you can take anything away from that, I mean, as, as everybody in this room listening and everybody who's listening worldwide, you know, startup grind, really, really focusing on that word viable. Oh, know. I just want to ask, did everybody vote today? Yes. Yeah, Vote it up. up. Yes. Just for a moment. It, the utilities <laughs> was in the top five issues in all uh, uh, municipal campaigns. The top five issues one was, uh, was the utilities for any single one of them. And that's how sensitive it is. You wow. can't just go in there with some new thing and say, use it. <laughs> just use it that. has to work. And it has to be clean. And people need to like it. On Both parties need to like it. Yep. So if you're in this room and you're building something, you can concentrate on the word minimum if you want to, but you might want to concentrate on the word viable because I think that's a more important word in the whole thing. Now, you guys, as far as like outsourcing, because we hear that word kind of floating around 
the startup scene, outsourcing. Did you guys experiment with outsourcing at all or no, or did you keep everything in-house? What did that process look like for you? Because I've seen the work and it's awesome. So how'd you get there? Okay, okay. Well, actually, Guy at first was an outsource. <laughs> and we just, we just put the shackles on him and now he's on the team. So uh, sometimes it works out really well. Um, the, we did outsource um, a little bit and we, we stopped and rolled it back because we weren't, we weren't on a successful path. Um, and it, that was, it, it did and it was actually internally very painful for us because it cost us uh, three months in a, in a really critical time. Um, that uh, uh, I'm, I'm almost like upset about it still. <laughs> Should I just keep asking questions about that? Like, get him mad. Y'all want to see him? He like hulks out. I'm just. But um, but uh, what what we did? What is awesome about our team is that when that didn't work, our team actually built what we wanted. We didn't think that we were capable of building the custom. We had a relatively custom application, mobile application, and we thought we might have to outsource that to get it done in a reasonable time frame. When that didn't work out. Guy did the iOS app, and it's beautiful. Uh, our other team member, Matt uh, Turndrup, did the Android app, and we had a professional consultant come in and do code review for him, so we kind of hacked the, the whole thing together, and it works really well also. Um, and so our team rose to the occasion when put behind the eight ball on that time experience. Can somebody tweet that? Like, if you're behind the eight ball, just rise to the occasion. That's kind of cool. Tweet it, hashtag list. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> So uh, that, that, we really, we, we fell down, we got right back up, and we, we won, wow. which was awesome. You know, it's also worth mentioning that when we outsourced, that was the single biggest step we made against our intuition. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of friction on our team as we did that, because every, every, every part of that process felt wrong. And as we would receive bills, as things would progress, we, we had to fight ourselves to continue doing it. And eventually got to the point where things broke down in, in, in an obvious way, and we had to ask ourselves, why did we go this route anyway? Mm -hmm. And we ended up taking it back internally, because as we outsourced it, I would be there obsessing over the front end. Guy would be there asking questions, deep questions about the back end. And, and we effectively were working on our outsourced project. <laughs> he said, we had a light come on. Wait a minute, we're doing the work. That's pretty awesome. Um, so there's another interesting thing that you guys did that is definitely worth mentioning. I got to talk about it because this, this had to be the most oddball thing that I saw you do in two years. Improv. Why the heck? Tech company improv and like they would drive to the, you tell the story. Why, why'd you do that? We did improv that. It. We did that. Uh, we drove out to Jacksonville every Monday for seven weeks <laughs> to do improv uh, classes, workshops uh, together as a team. Uh, Guy wasn't actually on the team at that point. Our other uh, colleague Matt was on, the, was on the team and Gregor and Matt and I would get in the car at 3.30 and head out to the Mad Calford, Mad Calford improv workshops and there, that, by the way, if you're ever in Jacksonville and you want to see some funny improv downtown at the North Star Pizza Station, uh, they play every Friday and Saturday and they're really funny. Um, so what we were doing is trying, we were trying to do some team building. And um, we were having some friction, definitely on the team, the front end and the back end, on how to, how to actually uh, accomplish goals. And uh, so, I said, all right, we're getting, out of, we're getting out of Tallahassee once a week, and we're going to do this thing that seems kind of crazy. But what I had, um, uh, what I had wanted to do was get more playful, get more interactive with each other, um, get more familiar with each other, embarrass each other, and be embarrassed in front of each other, and that sort of thing, in a, in a, in a healthy way. Yeah. You know. um, in, in front of other people who at the, at, in the beginning were, there were other 10 other people in this class and they were perfect strangers who became uh, friends and family as well. And what I ended up calling it was uh, entrepreneur agility training. Improv is basically <laughs> entrepreneur <laughs> agility <laughs> training. 
because Gregor and uh, Matt and I would have to figure out how to move together verbally and in action. And one of us would lead it. So because that's the way improv starts, is that you, somebody says something, and then the whole scene just goes. And so we, would have, that's, we have to learn to follow each other's lead, back each other's play, move with each other. If somebody changes it in a relevant way, move with that. And um, it's not something that, uh, and we also needed a crash course. And improv is uh, kind of delivered in, in probably about 80% of that. It was good. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cool. OK, so somebody needs to go ahead and start that as like a little business for startups. I'm just saying, improv, we need, entrepreneurship, agility. We need agility. that here. It, Micah, is there anybody who does comedy in Domi? We totally need to hook that up, man. No doubt, no doubt. Getting, fr getting in front of people, they, um, one, of the, one of the issues with startup teams is that typically some of the more tech, uh, capabil some more tech capabilities uh, won't necessarily be the best people to put in front of customers. Um, we wanted to be able to stand in front of customers and investors and other potential acquisition partners and that sort of thing to just all together. And this is us and this is how we interact and this is how solid we are and this is how we made it work. That's pretty cool. So if there's a takeaway in that, if you're in here and you're building something, company, something, make sure that you think of unconventional ways to sharpen your skills. Don't always look at your craft as the only means to sharpening your skills. That brings up another thing. Another thing that Les does that I think is phenomenal, and I'm looking around the room and there's like rock stars all in the room, just don't want to look at them too long. But you guys, like that gets creepy, like, Looking at you. No, I'm just kidding. But, but you guys like tap into resources that are in Tallahassee that in themselves are unconventional. There's one sitting out in the audience right now, and I'm going to let you say his name. Oh, my gosh, yeah. So um, for a little over the past year, I've, uh, I've been consulting with uh, Simon Anderson, the uh, foresight professional in future. Can somebody raise his hand? Raise his hand. Raise his hand. This dude is a gym in the city. This is, this is right in line with my hyper desire to be informed. Contracting di directly with Simon to push research in front of me and push new information in front of us uh, every month is, is part of essentially my um, um, obsessive need to be informed. Now, what this has enabled us to do is avoid a lot of pitfalls. Wow. Last year, Last year, we were re getting ready to do a major pivot, something huge. And we put, we put it on the shelf because we realized that at that stage, to enter the market doing what we wanted to do, and it was largely on the information that Simon gave us, and it didn't scare us off. It just said, not now, and let's reimagine it when we are ready. And I still get those updates uh, uh, from Simon. Now, this, uh, uh, this is something I can't under sell is you can have a nice chat with somebody like Simon, Simon in particular, and, and you can maybe get some insight into what you're working on or maybe some nugget and inspiration and whatnot. But a, for, a formal scope and a contract that allows him as a consultant to really dive into the research, not just what you and I do on Google, you know, but the, the network of foresight professionals that he has access to on a global scale, people who are thinking about now and the future, and how your industry and possibly your business, your life, could evolve in the marketplace over the next five years or so, I, want, I love having access to that. It is so enlightening, and um, not just the team, but uh, my wife and I, we, uh, we also engage in it on a personal level, and it is incredibly rewarding. Uh, it also allows her to uh, do things to kind of predict what she can do in her career as an academic as well. And locally you also mentioned some other players and I'll just rattle them off. You talked about Taltech, you talked about... Taltech is how we met. That's where it all went down. Yeah. Taltech wow. is how we met and how I knew Gregor. There we go, clap it <laughs> up. We got some Taltech members in the building. That's what's up. Good stuff. Oh, but there's a lot more too. FSU, and uh, in the College of Business, and in particular, JMI. Uh, if it was not for the College of Business and the Jim Moran Institute uh, supporting less and backing us before we even had an idea of what it is we're going to do, 
we probably would never have gotten off the ground. Wow, clap that up, everybody. JMI, FSU, yes, they are the champions. I said it, it's on tape. But there are so many resources. Less um, competed in the first in Ovation. That's cool. FSU has an annual competition where, where student startups can, uh, can get up uh, in front of, in front of uh, an audience and wow. compete with one another and, uh, and win prizes. 2012, man. Just, yeah, two years ago. April 2012. Wow. That was before I actually got involved. I was sitting in the audience watching their pitch, and I was like. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I'm, I'm in. That's good stuff. So that's really, really, that's a good testament to the community support, you know, of the startup and of idea makers. We were even at, uh, did you know the uh, Making Awesome Makerspace down by TCC? We had our offices there for about uh, six months. And when, our, when one of our tech uh, guys wasn't coding, he would take a break and he would just go geek out on a 3D printer. Well, what he, what he figured out was, this is Matt Turndrup, who's one of the co-founders, and uh, he's not an active team member, but he's out, in, he's out in LA, and he has this great blog called hackertrips.wordpress.com. And he's, uh, he's figuring out how to hack 3D printing, figuring out how to hack security systems and whatnot, and just putting it out there. And it's kind of, <laughs> it's kind of fun, because that was a little bit disruptive to us as a, in trying to figure out how to legitimately put a product to market. But for him, it's, it was, it's perfect. He's a tinkerer, and he just likes to mess with stuff, take it apart, see how it works. And so uh, the, maker, the, the Making Awesome Makerspace is a great resource for just going down and playing around a little bit. Wow. So that was some nice recreation. Um, uh, cool. I well, think you know, it. I got to give myself a plug. Oh, yeah. Massive Court <laughs> jumped into the game, and that's kind of how we got intimate mm -hmm. with the whole Les project. Massive Corp coming in. What did they do? We had never heard of, we had never heard of ideation <laughs> prior to the fall of 2012. I thought it was just some made-up stuff, like ideation who says that, right? Um, then we got into it. And uh, Vincent took us through several ideations and really broke it down for us. Uh, we, were, we were totally exposed <laughs> in these ideation ses sessions, way more than improv. Um, and we had to figure out where we were going to go. And we would always map it out. Uh, we would have the vision. We would have the capability. But putting together that map and the strategy um, was, uh, was really critical, and Vincent and Massive Corp really did help us pinpoint how we were going to go and stay passionate about where we were going as well. Clap that up one time. I'm just saying. I'm a clapper. I'm a clapper up. That's good stuff. And so, again, community support here in Tallahassee is phenomenal, and it's interesting how you guys have tapped in, tripped into, and just been exposed to you know, the riches and the wells of, of knowledge and information that's here in the city. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really, really cool when you're putting that on the forefront. Um, at this point, I mean, is there anything that you want to bring to the table yeah, that gotta, we haven't talked I've, to? I've got to say that um, uh, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of like this goal of matching students with experienced entrepreneurs and business owners. Um, and I'm really happy that we got to actually do that. You know, I've worked with uh, um, three, three of you. Two of you, you two are here, mm -hmm. Gregor and Guy. Both, recent, both, both graduated FSU last year. And then prior to that, Matt, who graduated the year before that, yeah. we've actually been able to cultivate that successful experience of student to entrepreneur to startup and launch. Um, which is which is kind of cool. Like it's uh, and you know we got started back in 2012, so it was even pre way pre Domi and Made in Tally and a lot of the incubator mm -hmm. kind of push that we've got uh, uh, going on. And um, I almost wonder what it would be like if it happened right now and there were all these additional resources <laughs> available. Uh, but uh, I I think that that I just want to say that that uh, experience is achievable if it's what you want to try to architect. Uh, there are very talented uh, individuals, young individuals in the student, in the student population. Um, and reaching in and actually st sticking with them while they work out what it is they want to do. Uh, helping them figure it out sometimes is, is necessary as well. Leading a little bit forcibly <laughs> also. But um, uh, it's worth the investment if the project means something. And I really appreciate the fact that you guys have stuck around in Tallahassee to do this.
because I don't want to be here by myself doing it. That song was about to make me. <laughs> the heck? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I ain't crying. But no, I think the, the big word, the big word that, that just kept you know, spinning in my mind when you were talking about that is nurturing. If you're an experienced business person in this room and you've got some chops and you see some young guys coming to the table with some grit and some, and some get busy, wrap your arms around them you know, bring them to the forefront. And I know that's what Domi is all about. And I know that there's people, you know, in this room and abroad, in this community that want to wrap their arms around um, people. I know my man over here, John, I mean, he's always done it. Even when we think about like people like Ryan Bonhart, that brings up the story of Ryan Bonhart, which you guys go, raise your hand, Ryan Bonhart. Stand up, in fact, get on the mic. Get, up, get on the mic, no, I just can't. Look, I'm wearing his gear, sweat, get, mic. Zoom in, you got it, zoom. All right, we got it. But, <laughs> but Massive Academy and Ryan Bonhart is another cool example of that. You know, this guy came to the table with ridiculous, I mean, say the word ridiculous. Ridiculous. So I don't have to say it again. Do, okay, you wanna say it? On the count of three. One, two, three, ridiculous. Passion, and we wrapped our arms around him and now he's like doing amazing things. How many students do you have right now at Massive Academy that you've actually given HTML and CSS? 13 Gs, right here in Tallahassee, trained up, chops, right? So again, the word is nurturing, and I think that we have to do more of that, so that's really, really, really cool, and I'm glad you brought that to the forefront. What I'm about to do right now is like shut my trap, unless I got a joke. You don't mind if I tell jokes? I Oh, I you got think one when you're more. Done with you got yeah, some stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, so uh, another word to put in there is teamwork. Wow. Clap that up. Clap that up. Clap it up. These guys help teach me to stop being Superman, <laughs> and that sometimes, in fact, most times, it's best for a project to delegate to cart compartmentalize for certain things. And it made me comfortable with the idea that I don't have to do everything myself. Wow. Um, before Les started, I was in Miami. And I actually had a consulting company there, successful, and I enjoyed it. And it was entirely all me. Um, that was, in retrospect, uh, I, a bit of a flaw. Um, and I sort of knew it at the time. And in fact, I closed down that company while it was profitable and successful. And I threw everything I owned in a U-Haul and I moved to Tallahassee um, because I wanted to try and start again entrepreneurially, but to do it with a different angle. And I felt that if I had stayed down there, I would have had too much of a, of a crutch to fall back onto. And I came to Tallahassee essentially to do this. I enrolled at FSU because I wanted to find business partners. Mm. And uh, wow, he hacked FSU. Look, I'm just going to enroll and find business partners. <laughs> That's cool. Like, I'll pay. You know. So I I I found a brilliant back end business partner in class, and I found a brilliant and I found a, a brilliant CEO, visionary, front end, amazing all around guy in Jason. Wow. And, and that, that enabled me to do exactly what it was I was hoping to do just about three years ago. Wow, wow, that Teamwork. is so cool. That's so cool. And, that, and another word that jumps into that is humility, being able to be humble. How many people in this room have a startup? Raise your hand. Because I suck at being humble. <laughs> Clap that up. Because I suck sometimes at being humble, but that ability to humble yourself to the greater good of the team. It's so important, and that's something that you've got to learn and really, really push forward. So that's good chops. Any other stuff you guys want to bring before I let the gators out on you? Because they're going to get you. They're like, hi, they're going to get you. I'm just saying. One, uh, one other thing that um, I'd like to add, and I don't want it to be out of place, but uh, one of the other areas in, in dealing with uh, ideation and visioning and uh, foresight um, uh, research is we, we've been able to actually identify the next two things that we're gonna do. So these are, this is just the first, this is our entrance into the market. We're gonna scale doing this, and then we've got the next thing that we're gonna do, we've got a, a prototype in process for the second thing, the thing that we're building. And then the third thing that we're building, hopefully, 
will be sort of like our Unix play, but is what I call it. <laughs> but uh, we've, that, that's the kind of thinking about not just what you're trying to get to, what you're trying to do, get to market, get the first, uh, get the first sale and that sort of thing, but where are you gonna go? Are you gonna die six months later? You know, are you gonna keep innovating? Are you gonna keep uh, building? Or are you just gonna scale that one thing? Is that gonna be successful? Sometimes it is. But for us, since the energy in industry is moving so fast and there's so much investment going into it, we have to try to stay ahead of it. Otherwise, we won't get past Tallahassee. Well, I got one more groups exercise for everybody. I, I want everybody to like repeat this one with me. This is like really, really cool. It's gonna help you. It's gonna help you like think. Innovation is not a buzzword. It's a survival word. So can we all say that together? Innovation is not a buzzword, it's a survival word. So you've always got to be thinking. So people um, um, like Simon out there, get with him and get with people and wrap yourself around um, and put yourself in environments where innovation thrives and you can always get new ideas and always take those ideas and take them further. So what I'm about to do now is just kind of go into a question and answer session. You guys don't mind that. Um, so everybody can ask questions and really, really dig into you. Um, don't hold nothing back. Leave everything in this room on the table. Get them. Give them. Ask questions. That's what I'm saying. Get them. Who got questions? Um, you said that the product is available for free. Um, what is your? How, how do you monetize it? Well, there is a, a very small license fee to the uh, utility, and then we do have other ways of uh, okay. revenue. The utility companies license it from you. Or? Yes. Like I said, it's not, it's not free to the utility companies. It's hundreds of thousands of dollars from our competitor, and it's much, much less for us. OK, I understand. Um, and it, it works with um, all the utilities, not just electricity, gas, and water? Correct. If the utility, can, if the utility, that utility smart grid is smart enough, which a lot of them, a lot of water and gas aren't. Uh, In Tallahassee yeah. right now is electricity. Yeah, their, their water, uh, water grid is not as uh, efficient as their electricity grid. Okay. Um, one last, um, what, what, did, what does the keep utility companies from using, um, doing this at themselves as a value-added service? This is a great question, and this is what happens with um, in most, well, sorry, investor-owned utilities, a lot of them already have. They're investor-owned. They, actually can raise funds and spend money a lot with a higher degree of discretion than a public utility, which, like I said, has, is one of the top five political issues in the, in the election that hopefully everybody voted in today. So if there's something in there that says they're spending $100,000 or $200,000 to uh, either develop something or purchase something, that's going to get, come under high, a high degree of uh, scrutiny. Now, in any public organization, does it cost a little bit of money to do something? No, it costs a lot of money to do something internally. So really, uh, really affordable market solutions is what, particularly municipal utilities, that's our, that's our target. Thank you. That's cool. Other question? I, I have a joking question. When you said you <laughs> business partners, I thought, man, these people are trying to get their MRS degree, you know, women trying to go to meet a husband, and men trying to go to But you're trying to get your LLC degree. <laughs> there we go. Okay. I, I like that. Yeah, so you can uh, I'm going to steal that. Thank you, you should. You should. So I was going to ask um, about your uh, revenue streams, but I kind of want to ask you a, a question beyond that then. So now that you've gotten Tallahassee, um, What's, what's the next phase? Who are you looking at in your short term and who are you looking at in your long term as far as uh, other municipal utilities that you, have you contacted them? Yeah, we have, we have dozens of sale, uh, proposals in the pipeline. Awesome. And, uh, and we've actually attracted a lot of attention because we're doing it here in Tallahassee and Tallahassee's utilities are so highly reputable. So the fact that they're looking to go with us uh, is getting us a lot of visibility. Also, how, I mean, I'm thinking about in my business, you know, I use a lot of induction cookers and a lot of fridges and some heating elements and all these things that are very, very electricity. That sounds awesome. I got to see your operation. Yeah, it's, 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 it's really fun. <laughs> um, but the, the question is, you know, for businesses to be able to utilize something like this, that's a game changer. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, I was sitting the other day looking at the back of the label on a fridge, looking at how many kilowatt hours you, know, <laughs> you, know, you know, use and then trying to look at my bill and see, oh, it's 13 cents and then calculating it all.
Well, right now, if you wanted to pull it, you could go to E plus online. And this is the value added service that the city of Tallahassee already, already does. But it's a pull. It doesn't translate into dollars. You're not going to get it in a notification form. And it's not pretty. So um, <laughs> you, can, you can get it. You can get it. And uh, interestingly, what you're talking about is something that people have been doing for about 100 years yeah. by doing things like turning the HVAC up or down depending on the, on the, on the weather when they're not at home. Turning, remember, everybody's parents would turn the lights off when they left sure, the room. You don't know how much that no, you don't know what impact it has, but people have been doing it knowing that it makes an impact, but they couldn't quantify it. They just knew that it meant something. Um, and now we can get a higher degree of actual intelligence about that quantification. Uh, so to go off what he was talking about, um, I've heard like the technology of where you can, um, I don't know the right words, but basically monitor on, I guess, certain smart grids, like what outlets are, are pulling the energy, mm -hmm. and you know, they can smart, smart off or whatever, turn off, um, you know, like uh, phone chargers or whatever, you know, turn off that outlet when the phone charger's not being used. So how far out is, I guess, the technology to monitor, like, say for Rayleigh's confectionery, to know um, like what units are taking the most. There's, a, there's actually a convergence that's probably not, gonna, uh, probably not gonna take that much longer, but there's the home area network, which are the things inside your house, and now that the internet of things is becoming more and more connected, but there's the home area network, and then there's the smart grid where the actual power comes from. Right now, those two things are relatively disconnected. Unless you can go buy a, a device that's a couple hundred dollars and you can put it on so outside of your um, meter, your, uh, no, your electric panel, and it's called a TED is the, yeah, Ted is the, one. Ted is the nickname is one of them, and there's a couple others. And so uh, that will give you basically what we do, but you have to spend a couple hundred dollars and you have to hook it up yourself. Now. TED has an API, and it's only a matter of time before like General Electric and Nest and TED and that home area network and the smart and the utility grid come together so that you have all that seamless information about actual devices in your home. It's then become like a, a mint.com for utilities where exactly. you're thinking about like, you're spending this much on lights, this much on air conditioning. Right. And actually, what you're, what you're talking about, Ryan, is one of the areas that Simon kind of illuminated for us uh, over the past year and why we didn't go in several, in a couple times we didn't go in the direction we wanted to because we saw, you know, in a year, that's just not going to make a difference to anybody. Right. So, gotcha. Yeah, so, so you said um, when Google has the smart houses, it's Nest, and oh, you said other oh, private companies are already offering this to their customers. Mm -hmm. But so what do you have in the pipeline that's going to distinguish your service from that? You know the um, that term special sauce? Yeah. About the the startup, <laughs> we actually have a whole jar of secret sauce. So. <laughs> he said, "You know, have you heard that word special sauce? We're going to talk about it now." No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> but that's that's the question that we've been asking ourselves for the last year to make sure that when we took our first step, we knew that we, it wasn't going to be our last. And, and one more question. Uh, it might have already been answered, but I probably missed it. How are you reaching out to other cities to use this service? This is more of a direct sales kind of thing. You know, send, send a proposal. We have goodwill with the city of Tallahassee. We are just doing standard software sales kind of thing. Yes. So today we all hopefully voted, and you know there's a lot of discussion on how citizens influence government. And I'm sure that you guys, I mean, I, I know you guys had to jump through probably a lot of loopholes to get the city utility to change somewhat to provide for your service, the data for your service. And so my question is kind of this: How you know government has a lot of valuable data, a lot of useful data to make it far more efficient and how did startups influence government? It's a good question. I'll, I'll let it process for a bit. Do you, you have something? Uh, 
Uh, yeah, I can. There's there's a lot of examples going on right now. Did you want to answer this? No. There's a lot of this going on right now with the health information exchange, um, particularly uh, in the areas the the very uh, clustered, like the highly clustered demographics, like seniors, where you know multiple decades equals one behavior relative behavior pattern in with the uh, medical with the healthcare community, so. There are a lot of startups working off of that API for Medicare data to help try to improve the patient experience, improve the provider experience, give a, a, a mutual, uh, mutually beneficial value proposition to, to both. Um, uh, you know, lower the costs of delivery, lower the costs of, of access, and that sort of thing. So that's one area. One area that uh, startups are doing it. The other is just in this, I mean, energy, obviously. We are influencing a public entity and its consumer base. In, in a public utility, the end consumers, the utility bill payers, are also the voters. So the, they vote their board of directors in and out on elections every four years, not through a shareholder meeting or anything like that, but through an actual election, and you can go to the City of Tallahassee Commission meeting and stand up there and for three minutes talk about how pleased or displeased you are with the utilities' decisions if there's an open uh, forum. Um, the other uh, areas that I think that uh, uh, startups could really influence is learning how to navigate the government consulting uh, system. You know, we saw this with the um, Affordable Care Act web exchange, web platform, where you know, the best companies didn't really go for it because there's a high compliance cost to do that. So if startup, startups and government could figure out how to lower that transaction cost of actually just bidding on the project, I think we'd see a lot more activity from the startup innovation community helping to solve the problems inside the public sector. I, I can't do better than that, so I'll just co-sign Jason's answer. That, that is uh, a great idea. Um, I wish I knew how to accomplish that. That is a regulatory innovation that I think would be remarkable to see in the marketplace. Um, I can think of a workaround in the meantime, <laughs> which is uh, um, there, are, there are a lot of existing consulting companies who do have that arm that deals with the government. They have that process in place. Uh, they have their public sector sales team, their public sector account managers. Now, then there's the startups with the new innovation. So you see Apple and Google and Yahoo and whatnot, they're just snatching up new ideas, right? Well, it would be great if government consulting agencies, you know, the Accentures and even the local smaller ones and mid-sized ones would look for those innovations figure out how to leverage those, those in the startups, and do an aqua hire, you know? Wow. A mutually beneficial aqua hire. Is there a list that you can get that shows the companies that are over open to doing that? Open to doing it? I don't know. You can get a list of the companies who are actually government contractors, though. And then you can poll them to see who's opening to do that, open to doing it. give up a lot of your rights when you do that as a, uh, I mean, we, we bring in the product, because then it becomes kind of their brand, <coughs> so they have a lot more to say. So you get you money that you that you don't have, but at the same time, you have to give up something. And, and, and with anybody that, that takes your product, then that you don't have any seed money of your own, so it's like a cool. But not really a product, it's a proposal. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, I find the proposal very well, and they accept the proposal, and they would have to stick to that proposal for them, so that. Right, that's, that's what I'm saying. Like, if you incubator, they will accept your proposal if it's a good product that they want back. And so they'll 
confronting money, but at the same time, you can, you're giving up the power. You see what I'm saying? You're not a 100% owner of it. So they take it, package it, and then they market it, and then you get the residual off of it. I mean, that, that is that tech transfer or the small, or the yeah, small business development center? Yeah, it's the one uh, family over there in Innovation Park. The, yeah. the, the, the SBDC, the yeah. Business Development Center? Right. Okay. They, they do have this product, because they tried to buy one of my products. And I, I was like, nah, I won't. I won't. This, is, this is a, the, the um, universities in general are really challenged by their, the way they've been doing things right. with respects to technology transfer and commercialization. Um, and I, yours, uh, your um, story is uh, all too common, unfortunately. But, that, but with, with, with Sam, you have 10 million tech startups, uh, I think it was last year. Anyway, I think the new, London University is mostly for more their faculty when it comes to startups like that. Well, the small it's, it's business outside that can come in. Or, or just now. Well, I know that family actually, the family the the university is all over. University is all over half of the Bayos now. University of Sun New Boys, family. Most universities have started their own incubator. But what I'm saying, what it looked like to me is that they promote their faculty members members instead of myself just walking in off the street and they're going to, you know, support me. And because like he said, they, they do want the license and, and but it's mostly to it's for the community too, but mostly for its faculty members to do research and come up with new ideas and innovation. That's what I get from that. Is there some more questions? More questions? Okay. What was the initial thought process of LESS? Was there a personal situation or happening that brought up the idea to provide energy for LESS? Cool. Um, so originally it was a group of very passionate, eager students, plus professor, who wanted to do something together because we knew that we had the talent and interest to to dive into the startup world, and it was a brainstorm. Uh, Les actually was the second idea to, to come out of it, um, but, but we knew that there was a team and we wanted to work together on something. Uh, Les came about because uh, that was an industry where, where there was a bit of experience on the team and we wanted to see if it was possible or not. So possibility lined up with experience and and, and the idea process, that's legit. And uh, like I mentioned before, this isn't a new idea to, to do this kind of thing with the smart grid. The, the big player in the market is uh, Opower. They just went public earlier this year. They started in San Diego seven plus years ago. Um, municipal utility got them to buy in, do it uh, a certain way, uh, and we are coming at them. I ask because I know you stated previously that so many companies are making billions, billions off of this energy type of program, or whatever you want to call it. And I thought it was more so of a thing where you guys were thinking more so of people that might need this at a lesser or affordable rate. So I thought that's it was true. more so as a caring type thing. That's how we, that's how it evolved very quickly. So at first, you know, there was, um, uh, the, several of the team members were thinking, oh, this is a software as a service business, and we're going to compete in this industry and uh, get the market where the existing players are not and figure out how to outsell them. Um, the, we were doing it in a different way. We had come up, they had come up with their idea in 2011 and 2012, post-cloud, uh, the current iteration of the cloud anyway, and then, but the O powers and simple energies of the world, the other bigger players had come up with theirs pre-cloud innovations. So they had some really heavily, he they still have some really heavy co capital costs, which is why they have to charge so much for uh, what they do. So then Gregor and I, the, one of the reasons why we're still around and we're the team that's shipping it is because we wanted to, and why Guy is still here after a year and a half uh, as well, is, we want, it, we want to give it to people. We want it to be almost zero cost. The smart grid has evolved and the cost of the infrastructure is high. That's where I'm saying the billions of dollars are coming from, investing in the smart grid and the energy industry. So 
But if you think about the smart grid, it's paid for either by the utility customer who gets charged by the utility company who put in the smart grid, or you got a federal grant like the city of Tallahassee did to put in the smart grid and match it with some other dollars. All of that, people pay for that. So the smart grid exists. It costs billions of dollars. In Tallahassee, it costs about $50 million. And why should there be another charge for you to get the information out of it? That's awesome. Any other question? Well, I, don't think I, I keep on adding to that to, okay, that, uh, to that question. Um, so the original thing that did start less was the question of why isn't this here? Why isn't this in place? And and that was with a different team uh, back then. But uh, eventually, that question alone couldn't sustain us, and uh, we fizzled out. And after that, we, we, we sort of looked at it from a different angle and we realized by then we knew that A, there isn't anything in place in the angle that we're taking it from, but, uh, but, but B, nobody is doing it because it's not the most profitable way to go. And the team that you see here sitting in front of you today is the team that's dedicated to making sure that it's there and making sure that it's affordable and making sure that everybody can have it. Yes, we are nimble and we are passionate. And highly capable. <laughs> so, and, and we, do have, um, we do have the resources to persist for a reasonable amount of time until our next innovation and the one after that. So we've got When Google the, releases a product, if it doesn't get 100,000 users in, in, in adoption, they're going to shut it down in a week. That's not our situation. So bring it on if large companies are attempting to do it. You see, he said, right, bring it. He just said, bring it. I think he got that on tape, too. Look, he got it on tape. Uh, to follow up to that, are you guys a blip on anyone's radar? I mean, because you're coming in providing <laughs> service much, much less um, expensive than services that are already in place. So that's, that's really soft. We on, I think we only will be if we unseat one of them out of an existing contract, which is a goal. <laughs> so if, I'm, if we are successful in that goal, if I can make that sale for us uh, and unseat an existing player or convert an investor um, backed one from their service provider who's not really known, it could be just some IT back-end company that doesn't specialize in it but contracts with them, if I can convert them with our, with our system, I will. And as soon as that happens, uh, we will be ripe for the plucking and we will have to deal with that. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. This, it's a, it's a, we, are, we are snubbing our noses at the uh, conventional way of doing business here. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, there, could be, there could be some really good and a few bad repercussions from that. And we, this is another thing about improv. No fear. No fear. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. The question is, uh, is the, the second thing and the third thing, is that really where the money is? Um, unknown, because those, the market doesn't okay. exist. Uh, okay, because it's always, is that where you want the money to be? Yes, absolutely, because those market conditions don't actually exist yet. So if we can time, what we are planning 
six months before those market conditions exist and get one early adopter, our valuation will be astronomical. It is a build on top, so if you think about it, what you're doing now in a way is akin to the freemium model. And Not you, like that at all. And, <laughs> and then you model, and then you make your money the next. On V2, yeah. V3. I mean, which is, which is great. Mm -hmm. I mean, just, I, I like that, but I think it's important for entrepreneurs because one of the terrible things that happened was because it's so easy to get on the field and get on the 50 yard line, people started giving away the product. Mm -hmm. It's like, guys, you don't even know what it's going to take to get in the end zone. <laughs> and it ain't going to happen with free. Right. So I think it's important. I mean, I think it's great, though, to give this much value and that's your premium. A lot better than giving away angry birds. You know? No doubt. Uh, so, but, so when do you think, when do you see the next move? Do certain things have to happen in this first phase in order to trigger? No. Oh, good. Already, we're, we're like three months from shipping. I just don't know if anybody's going to be ready for it, so we got to keep it. <laughs> I don't know if you're ready for this part yet. Wait for it. <laughs> you just. Wait for it. Just blame so, it on Simon. Let me get this right. You say you're a software as a service company, right? I mean, if it were five years ago, that's what we'd be called. So. What? We're a people-centric energy intelligence company. That was spot on, like how you said that. Say that one more time. Like, I was like. Uh, we are a people-centric energy intelligence company. The intelligence comes from the grid. We deliver it through multiple platforms, SMS, email, uh, web, mobile, other social media uh, platforms. Yeah, that's, the, that's essentially still the sales model. It has, there's the, uh, the, the, the renaming of things. I mean, I can see that there's a couple people in the audience who have been around for a while. And I'm also, uh, I'm 41, so I've been around for a little while. And, uh, you know, the, the internet and then uh, software as a service and then cloud computing and, like, it's the same basic thing, thing just newer, faster, smaller, sexier, that kind of thing, more capable. And, um, so we are, instead of web, there's web-based, there's, uh, um, uh, the word platform is used a lot right now, right? So uh, the word platform is used a lot. Uh, we can call ourselves a platform that people access. Essentially, they do it through a software. So we are a software as a service. Software as a service, either you can release that software or you sell it in that We are, we do have to, this is, the, this is a really interesting business thing that we had to figure out where we want to give it to people, but we need the utilities to hook up the data, you know, feed the data into it so that we can actually do that. Now, in standard business process, for a contract and liability to be held on both sides, there has to be consideration on both sides. So we actually have to have a contract with a small dollar amount, a reasonable dollar amount associated with it. Otherwise, if something goes wrong, nobody's liable and everybody's mad. And so we've got that business process uh, locked down so that if something does go wrong, the contract is in place, it's legitimate, there's consideration on both sides, and we can figure it out from there. So that's the core of the deal right now, is I have to, we have to get the utilities to sign that piece of paper and start shipping us the data in that way. That was sweet. Question? I have a question. Um, I'm not too tech savvy. I'm uh, actually a user interface designer. So as far as these uh, user up. experience, <laughs> yeah. so we can we can talk on, on the other hand. But I have a question because you guys talk about passion, and you know that's a lot of you know big business. They don't really care. They all always look at the money. Mm -hmm. So we hear all about you know these large companies you know buying out these startups. Would you all be, you know, willing to to sell at that that point? I know I wouldn't because my passion's in it. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I'd rather give away my secrets sometimes because it's passion to me. If I'm going to help somebody else out, mm -hmm. that's what I'm going to do. Do you? Well, it depends. Uh, a large company. <laughs> <laughs> 
a large company, the right company, may offer the opportunity for you to have the resources to have a much broader reach in what you're doing and remain autonomous for the things that matter. Um, it's not always selling your soul. Uh, it certainly is a case-by-case -case thing, but uh, I, I do respect that question. And, uh, but, uh, but yeah, there, there, there are different potential outcomes to that. And because we have a two and a three, uh, you know, uh, 12 to 18 months out, um, there'd have to be, one of two things would have to be true. Either they'd have to buy into that and value us in that way as well, and also make those plays, try, try those things in whatever iteration they, just, they, they, they became with the new, with the new organization, yeah, or the the, uh, an acquiring company, I think is what we're talking about. Or, or we get to keep them, separate them from the, um, the covenant, uh, that happens at, a trans at, a, at an acquisition, and we can continue on doing those things as a, as a, in a new entity. So one of those two things would have to happen at this point. They would either have to run with the, big, the, the other big things that we're, that we're planning, or hold them harmless in the acquisition. And then you'd be very well funded. Right. Yep, and then we'd have the, exactly, we'd have the money to just go fast. So this may be rehashing over something you've already, I don't imagine you've already talked to touch on the subject, but if you have, I'm sure people would like to hear this again. Um, do, you, do you give aid in proposing people's proposals and find, helping them to make connections with companies that can um, uh, in, in, incorporate their designs and their proposals into uh, providable, uh, efficient electricity uh, uh, utilities for the communities? Um, I'm not sure I understand the, the, the actual question. I totally know where you're going, but I'm not sure I, I don't, I want to make sure I answer the question. You help to make connections and help people to make sure that they don't get taken advantage of. So that they can make their things happen, their proposals happen, and actually get a good, good part of it and be able to make sure that it, 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 it uh, comes into fruition. Can you be a conduit and actually strike a deal? Like if he has an idea, if he has a design, can you act as a conduit in between the, the chiefs to be to help get his design into play? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. We, that's one of the things that we hope to do um, with, what, with the network that we're uh, opening up, the platform that we're opening up, is um, uh, release limited access for new functionality. We're not going to come up with every idea, but um, w is it okay that we talk about this? Could be a rabbit hole. I, I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I'm, yeah. I'm like, you about to talk about the secret sauce? I was about to see me run. I was, have a nice night. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I, would, I would be happy to talk to you off, uh, offline about any, any idea that you had, and we could uh, see how we could help each other. It's probably something you've already overhashed, but I wonder. Maybe not. We're not that smart. So. <laughs> They're less not that smart. <laughs> but good stuff. What I want to do right now is just, you know, thank you guys for really coming up here. Like I said, you've been in the grind for a period of time. Your story is a phenomenal. Who says that their story is a phenomenal one? Go ahead and clap it up if you think so. This. This is some good stuff. This is another one of those pieces of magic that is in the community of Tallahassee that's just kind of bubbling up and coming to the top. So I get excited about it. I know Startup Grind appreciates you doing it. The guys at Google are like, oh my God, it's really, really great. So if everybody can just give a round of applause, we can go ahead and wrap this thing up. And thank you for coming to Startup Grind.